Steve Johnson and this is Renovation Project. I know it's been a little bit of time since we put out an episode and maybe you're wondering that we're not all committed uh, to this process, but we've got a number of other things going on and I thought right up front here today I would explain to you what's going on before we get into the episode itself. Um, what has been causing us to uh, delay these podcasts. We're certainly hoping to uh, get it uh, dialed in a little bit tighter. But towards the end of January of this year, I was on the phone with the um, uh, the assistant district superintendent of the Southern California Assemblies of God denomination, which I have been ordained with for the last 27 years. I, I presented an idea that was on my heart. I didn't know if it was even a thing or if it would be viable, but I, I said, hey, you got a minute so I could run this idea by you. And, and the concept is this. Um, in the game of baseball, uh, the relief pitchers uh, don't hang out in the dugout with the rest of the team. During the game, they actually go down to what's called the bullpen. And um, they're not out of the game. They're actually waiting in case they're called. Um, they're stationed off the field and... Again, waiting for a call from the manager if the starting pitcher gets into some issues. There are some relievers uh, that are considered long relievers. Maybe the pitcher gets in trouble early in the game, and so a guy has to come in uh, who's going to provide a little bit longer relief during the innings, whereas there there might be some other uh, pitchers, relief pitchers, that come in for an inning or maybe a, even an out or two to get the team um, out of trouble, that as it were, and uh, back up to bat in the following inning. Well, with that said, I, I presented the idea uh, to this district superintendent that I'm not a starting pitcher. I know my place. I know my spot. I'm a relief pitcher. And so I work out of the bullpen. I, I remain there until I get a call to warm up and to come in the game. So along with Renovation Project, Layla and I have started an additional ministry called the Pastor's Bullpen. And there are churches who are currently without a pastor, so I might come in for a little bit longer relief. And there are some pastors who might get ill even as late as a Saturday evening or Sunday morning, and we might get a phone call. Uh, There might be a situation where a pastor has had a really busy week with congregational issues or whatever, didn't have time to prepare, and I get a call. Or maybe the grandbaby just showed up. And the parents, uh, the pastor and uh, pastor's wife need to get out of town. Uh, We get the phone call. Um, The district superintendent thought it was not only a good idea, but he thought it was very timely for a situation as we are going through currently. So basically, we have been at different churches all across L.A. and Orange County almost every weekend speaking somewhere um, in relief. And you know what? It's just, it's been absolutely exciting. Um... But I'm also a full-time longshoreman working five nights a week still. Uh, This ministry, as a result of my employment as a longshoreman, uh, God has blessed us here with income and benefits and all of that. We offer the pastor's bullpen uh, pro bono. It's free of charge. And it's just, it's been a way to to, uh, give back the the gift that God has given me and share with churches who, um, in some cases, are rather, rather small and don't have the ability to even hire a pastor at this time. So we we are excited to come alongside them and assist. In addition to that, I am a professor at our denominational school, the Southern California School of Ministry, uh, teaching biblical studies and hermeneutics. Uh, I'm in the middle of a class right now doing that. Uh, So that is why the RP episodes have stretched much longer than we had anticipated. We were hoping to do one every, you know, couple weeks or so. And all of a sudden, a couple of months have gone by. But uh, we deeply cover your prayers and, and hope you will stay connected with us. Uh, if you'd like to drop us an email, uh, we'd absolutely love to hear back from you. So, uh, well, okay, let's, uh, let's get to it. That's, that's what's been going on, and so I wanted to get you up to date. You know, um, in order to build a house, it uh, might seem common sense that you have to go down before you go up. Um, now, unless you're into concrete and structural steel and rebar, most people don't really appreciate much of what goes into the unseen foundation in the ground beneath the house. All the supporting steel hidden above the ceiling, the moment frames that have to go in, 
And um, all of the structural headers and beams and things like that uh, that are buried deep within the drywall and the finished uh, cabinetry and tile surrounds and all that stuff. But even other trades uh, that, that I've worked with, insulation, finished carpentry, carpet, you know what? They don't think a whole lot about concrete either. And maybe that's, uh, that's a good thing. You don't want to have to think about that stuff. You assume that, well, concrete's concrete and it's doing what it's supposed to do, whether it's in a uh, foundation of a house or maybe it's in an overpass or uh, some kind of a parking structure and all that. We really think it's just supposed to do what it's supposed to do. And that's concrete is strong, right? And rebar and steel is just strong. But all, all things being considered, all of that is true. Uh, when done properly, when, when the foundation uh, is done per code, uh, per the engineer's plans and specification, uh, the house of the designed will safely rest upon the foundation and be secured, providing a, a comfortable environment and, and a secure home for the inhabitants. But you know when the, when the uh, windows start to stick and the door starts to rub, as a matter of fact, you're going to start slamming that door a little bit harder than you ever used to, uh, maybe you notice that there's some tile cracking in the bathroom on the walls, and maybe there's a crack that's developed in the concrete slab in your garage. Most of the time, people don't really pay much attention to the fact that it might be a foundational issue. Uh, they might just, uh, you know, uh, sand the door, trim the door, um, make some adjustments and tweak some things to make sure that everything kind of works, you know. Um, that might help. But the problem is that it's probably a foundational issue. Um, what you might ask or, or, or be wondering about are the factors that can lead up to a compromised foundation. And really, that's a great question. There are, there are several things that come to my mind. First of all, disregarding the need for a licensed structural engineer. And what, what the engineer does is he's going to take the architectural plans that have been designed um, that don't have any structural um, pages at all of how to build this house. It's just what the architect wants to build. The engineer simply takes that based upon the, uh, the open spans and the um, design that has been built, and they engineer a set of plans that will actually make this thing come to life. Um, another factor is in, in compromising a foundation is refusal to utilize the current building codes and city guidelines. Now, certainly the, uh, the engineer, the architect, are going to design within those parameters. At least that's what you're expecting because we're going to have to take this set of plans down to City Hall and walk, walk it across the counter and submit them to plan check, and they better be to code or else they're going to get kicked back and we have to make some corrections. Um, thirdly, contracting with a builder who isn't licensed and doesn't follow uh, building protocols. Um, that's an issue. You know, you might want to try to cut some corners, save some money, but in the long run, it could cost you dearly. And plus, you're not you're not uh, being blessed by the city uh, because that's that's certainly an issue. But lastly, and most important, um, a surefire way to assure yourself of building a house that will not last is to disregard the geological conditions the house is built upon. Um, as I said in real estate, the three most important considerations uh, for buying a piece of property are location, location, location. And, and that might be an exaggeration, but you know, it's not by much. Um, the point is where you buy, where you build, where you locate your business and construct your personal residence, it, it really is important. Um, we want these things, when we invest in them, to last. So where you build this is very important. Now, I know this uh, sounds really exciting to some of you. It would definitely to my grandson, Peter, who is all about dirt. Uh, so I want to talk with you a little bit about dirt uh, because, again, where you build your personal residence, your physical home that you currently live in, it, um, it correlates to where we build our spiritual home as well. Um, the, the ground we build our Christian worldview upon, uh, the house that we build, um, needs to take into consideration the destructs, destructive soil conditions that are surrounding it and that literally are under the surface that we might not even be aware. Um, and make no mistake, the soil condition around all of us has been seriously compromised. Um, 
You and I can withstand the poor soil conditions beneath us if we engineer our spiritual lives in such a way that we accommodate for the existence of that condition. Um, Shifting earth or stable bedrock, which do you think would be a better foundation to build a, a residence upon? Um, building in the house, a uh, house on the sand or building um, on solid rock. Which has a better chance of survival during any kind of a storm? Well, towards the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, uh, Jesus used this dual soil condition analogy to describe the person who is sensible, who is uh, listening to his word, and uh, one who digs down deep and finds a secure bedrock or solid rock to build a house upon. Uh, Conversely, he says that one is foolish if they do not heed his words. Um, They are represented as ignorant, as it were, as unwise, as not using sound biblical sense uh, or advice, but ignorantly building their house, uh, disregarding the conditions beneath them. It's a remarkable parable, actually, uh, not just because of the message, but but because of its location. And, and as already noted, location is absolutely imperative that we pay attention to. Um, these are the closing remarks, by the way, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7 uh, represent the entire Sermon on the Mount um, discourse. But here we find at the very uh, end of this particular discourse, um, it's summed up with an action point, it's something that, uh, after all of this teaching transpired on that particular day, uh, we, like those present that day, uh, because it ends with a therefore, and, and w- when that is included, it is pretty much telling us, as a result of all of this, therefore this. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing as he's kind of laying out this building parable. Um, Looking out at this huge crowd, Jesus is providing them expert building advice and how to build their structure, their life structure, their personal worldview. And he's challenging them to follow his trustworthy building advice, um, how to construct a solid, enduring life that doesn't crumble when the storms of life come crashing in. Now, um, it's, it's one thing to seek advice from an expert. You might have met with an architect and some engineers and, uh, you know, to get some advice, get some direction. And, that, and that's a good thing. It's, it's an altogether different matter, however, to actually do what they say and, and want to pay the price to have it done correctly and to have it done properly. Um, we need understanding. We, we need truth, but we need follow through. We, we can't just have the information and not do anything with it. Uh, And this is Jesus' concluding remark here at the Sermon on the Mount, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a sensible man who built his house on the rock. The wise person will not just hear. The wise and sensible person will put them into practice. And this is certainly uh, what James's, uh, what Jesus' brother James um, emphasized in, in chapter 1, verse 22, that we need to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, right? Again, it's one thing to have the information. It's altogether something else to actually put that in practice. Um, so I, what I want you to see here is this. Um, though this parable is often called two foundations. That that's really a misnomer. That really is not the emphasis at all. Jesus is not talking about foundations in this parable. We, we actually know that he is the only foundation that we can build our house upon that would make it secure. He, he's not talking about foundations. He's talking about where you build your house, the soil condition that you build your house upon. Um, we, we have vastly different ground conditions in this parable. One is solid, and the other is insecure. Uh, one is stable, the other uh, is shifting. One is able to hold up during a storm, and the other, not so much. So what is the storm? Um, it's not just the storms of life that we all go through, the, the difficult times. Jesus said the same storm is hitting both houses. Verse 25, the rain fell the rivers rose and the winds blew and pounded that house the rain fell the rivers rose the winds blew and pounded that house it says it 
Verse 25, verse 27, the same exact storm hit both houses, the one built on the sand and the one built on the solid rock. Now, I, I could, like so many do with this parable, get all allegorical and replace the rain again with bad days and life's disappointments, uh, the, the rising rivers uh, with the pandemics of life that devastate us as they come, um, or maybe the blowing winds as as gossip and those who spread evil rumors about us and we could we could take all the parts and pieces of this parable and allegorize it make it something spiritual and not just a reality and though all that could preach really well it really isn't at the heart of what jesus was trying to conclude with his sermon storms in the bible uh, especially in the Old Testament, typically illustrate God's judgment. Uh, Genesis 6, Isaiah 28, 2, 29, 6, uh, 30, verse 30, Ezekiel 13, uh, verses 10 through 16, and, and so on. There's a number of places we could highlight. So in the light of Jesus' words um, prior to closing this particular parable, he speaks of two gates, uh, kind of back-to-back -back on these parables. One is wide, and the other is narrow. And, and the one that most people take uh, with unstable ground beneath it, with sand, is the wide one. It's the popular one. It's the one everybody travels. However, listen to the outcome of that pathway, Matthew 7, verse 13. Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate, not the wide one that everybody takes, the popular one. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. Where does it lead? To destruction. And, and what was the outcome of the house built on sand without a proper foundation? Jesus said it collapsed, and its collapse was great. In other words, those who choose the narrow gate, uh, the one who build their house upon the trustworthy words of God, of Jesus, will not be taken out by the judgment to come. But those who choose unwisely this wide pathway, this, this uh, unstable ground, as it were, popular as it is, are choosing the consequence of destruction. Now, they don't necessarily even know that that's what they're choosing, but that is the consequence of that pathway and of that type of soil. Uh, Jesus was equating following and being obedient to his word as one who is securely embedded upon a solid footing that can withstand, listen to me, final judgment final judgment. So in Luke's account, uh, Jesus says that the house built upon him could not be shaken because it was, in his words, well built. Well built. Now that is most certainly a picture of you and I heeding his words and um, not going down the popular path, the wide gate, but following through with a narrow pathway and on the security of life upon his solid rock foundation. Um, so friends, this parable is really about your final destination. And Jesus is warning everyone who hears to listen and heed. Not be hearers, but doers of these particular words. There is life in no one else. There is no future in any other foundation. And you might think that's rather arrogant. Um, it would be if it's, if it's not true. Um, I mean, to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is rather arrogant if it's not actually the case. Um, the Apostle Paul understood this as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. He said, For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Um, location, location, location. Where you build your house is important, friends. Um, let me provide you with an example that um, there's an area here in Southern California on the south side of Palos Verdes Peninsula known as Portuguese Bend. Um, it's a beautiful area overlooking. As LA comes down, it's actually facing south, um, even though, you know, obviously west coast. But as LA comes down, it kind of bends, and Portuguese Bend is on that southern part um, of the South Bay area. Uh, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, back in the day, it's where the old marine land of the Pacific used to be. Um, and for a current perspective, it's, um, it's northwest of where the Trump National Golf Course would be. Um, that particular part of the uh, peninsula had been moving for quite some time, but it was back in 1956 that right after uh, a brand new residence had been built up in the area in the upper part of the hill, 
cracks were noticed immediately in the foundation. Uh, they were repaired and new cracks developed uh, just days later. And at that point, cracks at other locations were starting to be noted as well. Well, within a month's time, back again in 1956, um, the area was shifting three to four inches a day. And within, uh, I think it was two years, the land had shifted nearly 40 feet downward and uh, a 10-foot vertical drop. In that course of time, in that couple of years, 130 houses were destroyed. Over 200,000 cubic yards of dirt had, had shifted down towards the ocean. Um, and you know, it didn't really matter that the houses were built according to plan, according to the engineer's specs, according to the city-approved um, uh, codes and ordinances. Um, none of that mattered if the ground beneath these perfectly built homes was unstable and was moving. Um, earth winds every time in that case. And the results were catastrophic. The cracks developed because the stress placed upon the foundations and the moment frames and the steel was just too much. The earth moving just shifted these houses and tweaked them so much. It was, um, even though th they might have had caissons uh, drilled down, uh, helping support any lateral shifting, they, uh, they were snapped like toothpicks uh, with the sheer volume of earth that was moving at this point. Um, no traditional engineering calcs had taken into consideration what was about to happen. And though there was some movement prior to these events, nobody knew that 200,000 cubic yards of dirt was about to shift downward towards the ocean. Um, collapse and utter destruction and loss of, of these homes uh, because of the unstable ground that shifted at Portuguese Bend. Um, again, the houses were built according to plan, but it, it didn't matter. You know, in a, in a similar manner, the Israelites during the time of the occupation period, um, they were settling in with their new neighbors in Canaan. Maybe they were having them over for some barbecue, and, and uh, eventually they started exchanging sons and daughters for husbands and wives. They were warned about building their houses like the Canaanites built them, whose foundations included idol worship and child sacrifice and a very sensuous lifestyle. What they were instructed to do was to bypass the cultural norms of the Canaanites. God had given them this land. Um, they were to remain tethered to the God who had directed them, who had led them, who had opened up the, the land for them to occupy in the first place. Um, <laughs> Israelites got a bit distracted by the Vegas style of the Canaanites. They had just come out of the wilderness into a land that was described as flowing with milk and honey. I mean, that's a phrase that we're out of touch with, but it, it represents a metaphor of fertility and abundance. In other words, God was taking them from a wilderness experience of trusting him for, you know, on a daily basis with manna, to, to going into an area with Costco supermarkets and everything that they could imagine in sensuous pleasures at their disposal. So do you think God was trying to stifle their, uh, their new... Here, here he had given them this new piece of property uh, to inhabit, the promised land flowing with milk and honey, but now he's putting on the brakes. What, do you think God was trying to stifle them and their happiness, um, or was he wisely warning them of the outcomes of building their worldviews upon the unstable ground of the Canaanite position? The ever-changing sands of happiness and self-gratification that existed and does exist in the pagan lifestyles that are present. Friends, God was providing a narrow road in the midst of a superhighway. And that's not easy, is it? We experience that today. Is it, is it easy to disregard all the pleasures and the things that are out there and follow a narrow path? So let me ask you a couple questions. What do we do when the worldview soil beneath us all is compromised and unstable and ever moving? Another question. What if all we have around us is the sinking sand of humanism and, and the scientism perspective that says there is no God, we are all just on our own to live out whatever happy existence we can find? And lastly, Jesus is the only foundation, but what if there is no bedrock in sight to secure our foundation too? What do we do? Well, friends, not a problem if Jesus is your foundation 
location actually is secondary. It's not that we disregard it, it's very important. Um, we can thrive no matter what the current worldviews are, no matter how unstable our community, our nation, and our world might be. It takes some ingenuity, it takes some planning and preparation, but the end result will provide still a residence that can weather the storms of this life and especially the judgment that is to come. Now, let me explain it this way. I, I, I built a, um, a house on sand a number of years ago. You know, that's right. The place that Jesus said was not such a great place to build a house to withstand storms. Now, imagine for a moment that the, um, the, the sandy, unstable ground beneath all of our houses represents everything imaginable within the, the humanistic, godless culture uh, that we live in. And um, all of these belief systems, all of this worldview stuff around us, it's unstable. It's unable to support a robust, God-pleasing house that reflects his kingdom in a, in a dynamic manner. It's all sand. Everything around us, friends, is sand. We have a foundation of concrete in Christ. It's the only foundation that will endure, that will satisfy, that will provide us a security in this life and weather the storm that's coming. So is there a way that we can build in the midst of a place that is so unstable? Uh, one of the most unique projects that I, I built was actually a 3,000 square foot, three-story beach house on the strand of the Balboa Peninsula in Newport Beach. Um, this project is an illustration, the best one I could think of, a type of foundation that needs to be built. Um, when the soil conditions beneath are unstable, where bedrock is not to be found, and um, this was certainly unlike the Portuguese bend. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an unstable condition in that the, the entire hillside is moving, but yet how stable is sand, right? Um, we were up against sand and water, two ingredients that a solid foundation does not make. And again, Jesus already told us which foundation is more trustworthy uh, in the storm, and it wasn't sand. Um, given the choice, solid rock is, is obviously the better way to go. The house I built, uh, the renovation project, uh, which is is built on the project uh, episodes that we do is that big house in San Juan Capistrano. And we, of course, drilled down caissons down into solid bedrock. And, uh, and those literally were supporting and allowing the house to stand strong. Um, we didn't have that opportunity here at this house in Balboa. Uh, again, given the choice, solid rock is obviously preferred. Um, but there are several ways to build a house on sand that can provide security and a structurally sound foundation for a house. Um, the water table that we had, the ocean water table, was only seven feet below surface. And um, as a result, we had, to, uh, we had to design a monolithic single-pore slab footing system. And what we did is we over-excavated the entire lot three feet down, and then we, we mixed in uh, pallets, lots of pallets of concrete back into the sand, and then we recompacted the whole lot. That allowed us to, to actually dig the footings that we needed without them collapsing. Um, and um, you might ask, well, how does a heavy structure like this not sink in the sand with a water table so close to the surface? Um, sand might be unstable, but as long as it's confined um, and can't go anywhere, sand is incredibly dense. Uh, there are no voids in sand like there might be in a dirt foundation at times. Um, the engineer created a 12-inch thick concrete slab with, with two layers, uh, two double layers of mat uh, layers of rebar. And this slab literally floats on top of the sand. Um, it's, it, it's not got a very deep footing. Uh, but as you can imagine, when, when this is poured in a monolithic solid pour all the way through in one, uh, one pour, no breaks, um, it, it creates a floating slab that we were able to build a 3,000 square foot um, three-story house upon. Um, friends, as Christians, we can live in this world and not be of it. We can live in this world and build a solid foundation on Christ and not be shaken by the shifting sands that are around us. Um, not any foundation will do. Not any foundation will get us home free. Um, there's only one viable solid rock 
faith house that we can build, and that's upon Jesus Christ. Um, so the real question here today, friends, is can any spiritual pathway save you as long as you are sincere? Because you say, well, I'm glad this Jesus thing works for you. I'm sincere about this. But, friend, you could be sincerely wrong. Um, every religion uh, can be false, but they can't all be true. And um, so we have to come to the conclusion that either Jesus was telling us the truth or he wasn't. And I have, um, I have every reason to believe that what Jesus told us is the truth and the life and the way that we are to go forward. It's not narrow-minded, friends, uh, and intolerant to promote Jesus as the way, when in reality he is exactly that. It's the wise thing to do. It's the most secure manner by which you and I can build a secure residence that we know will weather the final storm of life and the judgment to come. So what foundation is your life built upon? Are you securely built upon the never-changing, stable concrete represented in Christ? Or are you sustained by the shifting landslides of the culture that's out of control? Friend, one's going to survive the final judgment, and the other is going to crash and burn. And it's my hope, it's my wish, it's my prayer that you build your house upon the solid foundation in Christ, because that is the foundation that will weather all the storms and take us home. Well, God bless you, my friend. It's been great to be back with you again. I, uh, I hope you're blessed, you're thriving. Until next time. Thanks for joining us today. For more information, check out our website at renovationproject.org. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can be alerted to when our next video